loving Father, we are so thankful for Jesus. Thank you so much that mercy still pleads and that the door of probation is still open. Thank you so much, Father, for what heaven has done for us and what heaven is currently doing for our salvation. We are told in inspiration that all heaven is interested in the salvation of man. And I just plead, Father, that as we are about to open up your inspired word, we are pleading that these words would bring life to us, that these words would draw us closer to Jesus. And I pray that as we come to the foot of the cross, that we would not just merely mourn over our sins, but that it would lead to a transformation of life. Please, Lord, we know that in the Beatitudes we are told, blessed are they that mourn. But that is not the end of the Christian experience. He must continue to advance from mourning to become meek, from meek to a hunger and thirst of the righteousness. And so, Father, we are not only to look and see what our sins done to Jesus, but it is to create within our hearts a distaste towards sin. And I just plead, Lord, that as we look and see what your word has to say to us today, that truly we would be driven into the arms of Jesus and that we would remain within his arms. For we are living in perilous times and only those who abide under the shadow of the Almighty are going to make it through this final crisis. Please, Father, we plead for your presence to be with us. We ask that our minds would be focused upon the written word. And as we fix our eyes upon the written word, to gain a clear understanding of your will, may the living word reveal himself to us today. We love you, and we ask your blessing upon us, for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Blessed Sabbath. Um, today is a very simple study. Um, I had planned, or we had discussed the previous time we spoke, that we're going to look at the issue of salvation, just study into this issue of salvation. And the last time we studied, we basically looked, well, we simply looked basically at the basic foundations to salvation. But we're not going to study that now. We'll pick it up, God willing, next time. What we want to do today, we want to actually look specifically at God's character and see what God is calling us to. We want to look at his character and see what he's calling us to. You know, there's a quotation that the Lord revealed to me in the book Heavenly Places, which Actually, you know, inspiration speaks about something that should cause us the greatest or the deepest joy. Do you know what she says should cause us the deepest joy? In other words, when we think of this one fact, she says, man, this fact out of it all should cause us the deepest joy in our hearts. Do you know what fact inspiration says should co cause us the deepest joy? She says the fact, she says that which should cause us the deepest joy is the fact that God forgives sins. She says that if, if anything you want to think about, you want to look at the year and say, well, what can I be thankful for? Be thankful that God forgives sins. She says that, that's Heavenly Places, page 23. And Psalms 85, the psalmist almost echoes those words. He says, thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sins. God is not seeking to condemn us. God is seeking to save us. He doesn't take delight in condemning people. Actually, he says in, 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 in Ezekiel that his great desire is that the wicked turn from their wicked ways and love. And then he says, why will he die? Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. So God does not delight in anyone dying in their sins. God is seeking more to reclaim us and redeem us than for us to perish. Come with me to Revelation chapter 13 before we actually pause and pray. Revelation chapter 13. I want us to look at Revelation 13, verse 11 and verse 12. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11 and verse 12. Revelation 13, verse 11 and verse 12. Now, remember what that quotation says in heavenly places. She says that, that that which would cause us the deepest joy is the fact that God forgives sins. And then she says, if we would take him, 
if we would take him at his word and forsake our sins, what should we do? We should take God at his what? At his word. But not only that, she says we must forsake our sins. We cannot delight in the fact that God forgives sins and then we continue in sin. That we, we, we are not to abuse the mercy of God. So she says that we are to take God at his word and forsake our sins. And then she says he will be ready and willing to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I must be willing to forsake and God is ready and willing to forgive and cleanse. But if I do not forsake, God cannot forgive. Revelation chapter 13. I want us to see verse 11 and verse 12 of Revelation 13. Friends, do you know that we are on the borders of the fulfillment of Revelation chapter 13? We are literally standing on the borders. And you know, this is just my own personal conviction. I believe that 2024 could be our last year of preparation. I truly believe that if we can see 2025 full through, now we don't know if we're gonna be alive, but I'm just saying you as an individual, but I'm saying collectively, I see 2024 as almost our last year of preparation. You say, why do I say that? Based on the prophetic facts, they show that this is it. And we're gonna look and show you. The, friends, a twin, you know, we're gonna just see, let's, let's read Revelation 13. And yeah, we're on the borders of the fulfillment of this chapter. Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 13 verse 11. It says, I beheld and another beast coming up out of the earth. I beheld, Revelation 13, 11, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. Now I wanna ask you a question, which nation is this? This is the United States of America. Now, the Bible says that America comes up like a lamb, but what does it eventually do? It speaks like a dragon. So it comes up in Christian principles. The foundation is Christian principles, but it eventually speaks as a dragon or as Satan. Satan is a dragon. So this is what America is gonna do. So question, when America speaks as a dragon, do you think it's gonna make laws um, friendly to God's people if it's gonna speak as a dragon? Or is it gonna make laws um, against the people of God? Against, so America eventually is gonna enforce laws or there's gonna be decrees. America is gonna make certain decrees that's gonna be specifically not against everyone. But based on Revelations 12, verse 17, it's against the remnant people of God. Why? It says the dragon was wrought, not with the entire world. It says that he was wrought with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So America is gonna make decrees specifically or laws, you can say laws, specifically against who? Against the remnant. Now, I want you to see, does America just get these laws from fresh air or is America honoring another power when it enforces these laws? I want you to see verse 12. Verse 12, it says, and he, that's America, exercise it, all the power of the first beast before him. Let's pause there. Which beast preceded America? Amen, it's the papacy. How do we know, what, what is that beast called? The leopard-like beast of Revelation chapter 13, verse one and two. It's a leopard-like beast. And it says that America is going to exercise the power of the first beast before him. Specifically speaking about the papacy or the leopard-like beast. Now I want you to see, what does, what does America do to the papacy or for the papacy. It says, and he exercised all the power of the first beast before him. And he caused the earth and them that dwell therein. Now look at what America's end goal is in prophecy. What is it gonna cause the earth to do? And them that dwell therein. To worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So America's purpose in prophecy is to bring honor to the papacy. That's their great purpose, is to honor the papacy. Now, I wanna ask a question. The papacy, 
What is the papacy? Who is the papacy warring against? It's warring against, it's warring against God's people. Now, who gave the papacy its power, its seat, and its great authority according to Revelation 13 verse 3? Revelation 13 verse 3 tells us there's a power that gave to the papacy its power, its seat, and its great authority. Huh? 13 verse 3. Who, 13 verse 2, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, it's 13 verse 2. If you can look at 13 verse 2, it says the dragon gave the papacy its power, its seat, and its great authority. So the papacy gets its authority from who? Specifically, it gets its authority from Satan. So the authority of the papacy comes from Satan. Actually, inspiration says that, that the papacy is actually... Satan's mammoth, this mammoth system of deception. This is his mammoth system of deception. So the papacy gets its authority from Satan. Now, Satan gives its, his, his authority to the papacy, but Satan also, America speaks like the dragon, so America is going to almost echo Satan's sentiments towards the remnant people of God. But now my question is this, what does Satan hate? Yes, he hates the remnants, but let, let's go back into heaven. Based on Revelation 12, what was Satan warring against inside of heaven? Okay, you, that's true. You can also see that partially in Revelation 12. But what was he warring against in heaven? Because it says in Revelation 12, 7, that war broke out in heaven. But what was this war about? What was Satan warring against? Okay, worship, that is true. But what was he warring against? In order for him to become supreme, he was warring against something. See, Revelation 12, 7 doesn't tell you exactly what he was warring against, but verse 17 tells you what specifically he's warring against. It's only what these people have. He's not actually against the remnant. He doesn't care who's the remnant. It's what the remnant has that he's warring against. It's the commandments of God. So when the papacy was set up, if Satan gave it its authority, what would the papacy be warring against from its very inception? The law of God. From its very inception, it will be warring against the law of God. But then the Bible says that not only will the papacy do it, it says America exercise it, the power of the first beast. So what would America war against if it's going to add to the same sentiments of Satan and have the same power of the papacy, what, the law of God? So America is not so much against the remnant, but it's going to make laws against the law of God. And because the remnant holds to the law, it's going to war with the remnant. Now, I want us to look at this quotation in, in the book um, Adventist Home. Adventist Home, page 340. I want you to see what the prophet says concerning. Now, let me ask you this. What part of the law do you think that the papacy has warred against and even America is going to enforce? Now, I want you to think. I want you to think. The Bible says that America is going to cause the world to worship the first beast. The Bible says that the mark of the beast has to do with worship. Question, which part of the, which, which of the law specifically deals with worship? The fourth commandment. Mm -hmm. So when uh, the papacy or when America enforces laws against the law of God, it's going to be something that's going to be against the fourth commandment. It's going to be Sunday sacredness. Now I want you to see what the prophet says. It's going to be warring against the Sabbath. This is in the book Adventist Home, page 340. Now, I want to ask you a question before I even read that. When was the Sabbath instituted? In Eden, not on Mount Sinai. The Sabbath was not instituted on Mount Sinai. The Sabbath was instituted inside the Garden of Eden. When man left Eden, he left with two blessings that he received inside of Eden. What were those two blessings that God gave him on Friday? The one he gave him on Friday and the one he gave him on Saturday. Marriage and the Sabbath. What do you think Satan hates? He hates, he hates marriage and he hates the Sabbath. He hates both of them. 
Now look at this quotation in Adventist home. Listen to what the prophet says concerning marriage and the Sabbath. She says, he, Jesus, referred to them. He, Jesus, referred them to the blessed days of Eden when God pronounced all things very good. Then marriage, that's in Eden, then marriage and the Sabbath had their origin. Twin institutions for the glory of God in the benefits and the benefits of humanity. So question, inspiration says that marriage and the Sabbath are what institutions? They're twin institutions. So question, if the papacy is going to make laws, or rather America is going to make laws against God's Sabbath, what, do we also, what must we expect also for them to attack? Because these are twin institutions. So the two institutions which God gave to man was marriage and what else? Sabbath. We know that America is going to actually make laws against the Sabbath according to Revelation chapter 13, verse 15, 16, 17. But before they can do that, they must first trample upon marriage. Why marriage first? Which institution did God give to Adam and Eve first between these? He first gave marriage the Friday. Then the, the Saturday gave the Sabbath. Now, I want you to see what the Pope just done a couple of days ago. Listen to what happened here. It says, Pope Francis, first time ever, Pope Francis allowing blessing for gay couples is significant but not systematic. Question, what has the Pope just blessed? Gay, gay marriage. He has now pronounced his blessing upon a gay marriage. You know how you know that gay marriage is not of heaven? Even if there is no clear text, God calling it an abomination, both in the Old and in the New Testament. When God created Adam and Eve, he says, be fruitful and multiply. Can two men be fruitful and multiply? Can two women be fruitful and multiply? It's an abomination. So Pope Francis has actually given his blessing upon gay couples. That's an attack against what? Marriage. Now, America in 2015 actually instituted, um, they've, they've legalized homosexuality. They legalized it in 2015. You know what happened in 2015 when they, when they legalized homosexuality? That was around June. You know what happened a couple of months later? Pope Francis came and he addressed Congress. After they trampled one institution openly, the Pope came and he addressed Congress. 2023, it says here, Monday, 18th December 2023, one of the 20 institutions were trampled upon. I wonder, 2024, what comes next? It says here, December 20th, 2023, Joe Biden welcomes, listen, Joe Biden welcomes Pope Francis' decision to allow blessings for homosexual couples. Now tell me which two powers are you seeing here? America and the papacy. Revelation chapter 13. Are they both united in trampling upon one of the twin institutions? That's 2023. I wonder what comes 2024. I wonder. Now, I want you to hear this. This year was actually a press conference on Biden's stance or America's stance on po the Pope's blessing of homosexuals. Mike Green, um, given the president's uh, strong Catholic faith, what was his uh, reaction to yesterday's announcement by the Vatican that priests can now blame, it can now bless uh, same sex unions? So I'll say this uh, the president, along uh, with many Catholics around the world, uh, welcomed a declaration from the Vatican uh, done with the approval of Pope Francis uh, that allows for the blessing of same-sex couples uh, and uh, certainly anything specific we would have to refer to the church but obviously we welcome uh, this step the step uh, the step in in the church ministry to the LGBT people WGQ people did you hear America welcomes the decision of Pope Francis. Biden welcomes it. In other words, they have united, the papacy and America have united to trample upon the first institution. They have united. Now, I want you to see this. It says that Father James Martin blesses homosexual couples at a Jesuit residence in New York City. 
Who was, who was behind us? The Jesuits. What does Pope Francis? A Jesuit. But he's not only a Jesuit, he's also a Freemason. But, 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 but how do you pronounce that? Bugly, that's Pope Francis. His election was celebrated by Freemasons, and he continues to advance their agenda. So he's not only a Jesuit, he's also a Mason, the current Pope. Now we're gonna tell you that this Pope is planning his death. Do you know that Pope Francis is planning his funeral? It says here, Pope planning his funeral. He is, <laughs> the Pope is planning his funeral. This means something, we'll come back to this. We'll come back to this. Now, do you know who's this man? We, we spoke about him a couple of weeks back. This is Mike Johnson, who is he? The Speaker of the House. He's the third most powerful man in America. Now, he's the Speaker of the House. Now, I want you to see what he has to say concerning homosexuality. This is the third most powerful man in America. I want you to listen to what he has to say. Now, someone says, if America's trampling marriage, how do they swing the pendulum to the Sabbath? How do they swing the pendulum? These are two opposite ends. One is almost trampling upon I would say religion upon the Bible, and the other one seems to be religious when you're gonna enforce worship upon the masses. Now I want you to see what does Mike Johnson say, what is his mindset concerning this current um, issue of trampling upon marriage? Listen to what he has to say. The only question is, is God going to allow our nation to enter a time of judgment for our collective sins, which his mercy and grace have held back for some time? Or is he going to give us one more chance to restore the foundations and return to him? And we ask that you not give up on our nation, not give us the judgment that we clearly deserve, but that you mercy and grace would guide us through these terrible troubled waters and that you would heal our land. Now, did you hear what he said? Will God bring his judgments upon us for what's happening in the, in the current society of America? or will he give us another chance to bring the nation back to him? So they're gonna use the, the, the immorality to push the nation to so-called morality. So I'm saying that this here plays perfectly what's taking place according to Satan's agenda. Now listen to what he has to say. Well, no, the, the terrible state that we're in, um, the faith in our institutions is as low as it's ever been in the history of our nation. Um, the, 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 the culture is so dark and, and depraved that it almost seems irredeemable at this point. We, you know, we're, we're, the church attendance in America dropped below 50% for the first time in our history since they began to measure the, uh, the data uh, 60 years ago. And the, the number of people who do not believe in absolute truth is now above the majority for the first time. So one in three teen girls uh, contemplated suicide last year. One in four high school students identifies as something other than straight. Um, we're losing the country. But at the same time, th this is not unprecedented. There's nothing new under the sun. And there have been great civilizations and, and societies in the past that God has worked through and saved and redeemed when all hope was lost. Did you have to say concerning that we are losing our country? Why? Because there are, there are young men that are acting or, or proclaiming themselves to be women. So what he's saying is that the reason why we're in the state that we're in is he's saying that it's due to immorality and homosexuality. And God is going to give us one more chance to bring the nation back to him. How is all of this just fitting according to the time limit of God's character, the fourth generation? 2024. Friends, I'm telling you, it will be God's mercy. And it is his mercy by warning us to tell us to get ready. Let us pause and pray, and then we'll get into the short study on God's character. Let us reverently kneel. <laughs> Loving Father, Lord, we humbly approach your righteous and holy throne. We are pleading that you please be with us, Lord, as we seek to understand more clearly who you are. For we are told in John 17, verse 3, that this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And we are pleading for your spirit to be with us now. 
Please, Lord, open up our hearts and minds. Help us to see the beauty of holiness, the beauty of your character, that our hearts might truly, as the Apostle Paul said, covered after those uh, most excellent things. And that which we should cover after is, your, is to become like Jesus. Please, may you bless us with your presence. May our hearts and minds be receptive to your truth. We are told in Matthew chapter 13 that as the sower went forth to sow, that even though it was the same seed, the same sower, the reason why the, there was no fruit in the life or that did not bear fruit on those different grounds was not because the sower changed or the seed changed. It was because their hearts were not ready or willing to receive that, that seed. And I'm just pleading, Lord, may our hearts be good ground that as we hear your word, we will not just receive it with joy, but we would understand it and that it would come deep within our hearts and bear fruit. Please, Lord, may you bless us and abide with us. May you please lead us into all truth, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come into Revelation chapter 14. I want us to read Revelation chapter 14. We're going to read verse 6 and verse 7. Revelation 14, verse 6 and verse 7. We are told in the book Councils to Writers and Editors, page 29, Ellen White is speaking about these three angels' messages. And she says that the theme of greatest importance is the third angel's message. What is the theme of greatest importance? And then she says, embracing the first and second. So it's not just the third angel alone. She says that the third angel is indeed a theme of greatest importance, but she says embracing the first and the second. Now, I want you to hear what she says concerning these messages, first, second, and third. She says the theme of greatest importance is the third angel's message, embracing the first and second. She says all need an understanding for themselves of these messages. What do all need? An understanding for themselves of these messages. And then she says, and to demonstrate them in their daily life. So she says there's something about these messages we need to understand that must lead us not just to understand them, but she says they're so practical that we're going to have to demonstrate them in our daily life. And then she concludes by saying this, that this is essential to salvation. So what we're about to look at, she says, is not, you don't have to guess, is this a salvation issue? She says, it is essential to salvation, to understand these messages and then to demonstrate them in our daily lives. Now, I want us to look at them. Actually, these are God's final messages before Jesus comes back the second time. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. The first angel's message, we're just going to touch on one aspect of this message. Revelation 14, verse 6. It says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. What does this angel have? The everlasting gospel. Now, friends, I asked this before. How long has this gospel been in existence? The gospel is as old as God. Why? It says the everlasting gospel. You will never find the Bible saying that Lucifer was everlasting. No, Lucifer was created. There was a time in which he had his beginning. But when the Bible refers to the gospel, it says everlasting, meaning, and actually the word everlasting applies only to God. God is everlasting, but there's something which is as everlasting as God is. What is that? It's the gospel. The gospel. How long has the gospel been in existence forever? Actually, inspiration says there was never a time. There's actually a commentary. She says there was never a time. Actually, let me just read this commentary. This is actually, yeah, what she says. This is in the book of Hebrews. There's a commentary where she speaks about this issue. This is in the commentary, the last chapter of Hebrews, the last comment, chapter 13, and it's the last comment. 
She says, let those who are oppressed under a sense of sin remember that there is hope for them. The salvation of the human race, now listen to this, the salvation of the human race has ever been the object of the councils of heaven. The covenant of mercy was made before the foundation of the world. It existed from all eternity. How long did this covenant of mercy exist? From all eternity. And it is called the everlasting covenant. And then this is the conclusion. So surely, so surely, as there was never a time when God was not, so surely there was never a moment when it was not his delight, when it was not the delight of the eternal mind to manifest his grace to humanity. So she's saying that as long as God existed, she says as never was there a time that God did not exist, she says never was there a time when it was not in the mind of God to manifest his mercy towards us. Friends, this is amazing love. Revelations 14, verse six. And I saw another angel flying the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. What does the angel have? The everlasting gospel. Friends, do you understand what God expects us to be? Because th th this angel is just a type of God's people. We're not going to study that. But this angel is just a symbol of God's people. Do you know what it means to have the everlasting gospel as God's people? Friends, do you know that the gospel is a wonderful simplifier of life's problems? That's what we're told in Ministry of Healing 363. If the gospel is a simplifier of life's problems, tell me what kind of people should we be? Problem solvers. That's what we should be. We should be able to solve the problems of the world. Why? Because we have the everlasting gospel. Imagine, imagine you're trying to solve somebody else's problem and you got that exact same problem. Will they listen to you? No. Wasting your time. The gospel must first solve our own problems before we can introduce it to the world as a problem solver. You know why many people are not accepting the gospel? Because it's not solving our problems. And one of the greatest problems that the gospel is trying to solve is the problem of sin. That is greatest issue. The gospel is trying to solve sin. Do you know that every other problem springs from sin? Every other problem springs from sin. You can name the problem. I tell you that the root of the problem is sin. Broken homes, what's the problem of it? Sin. Sickness, what is the root foundation of it? Sin. You can go through each problem and you'll find out that sin lies at the root of each problem. And the gospel simplifies life's problems by first dealing with the root issue, which is sin. And the gospel has a, a, a remedy for sin. And you know what is that remedy? That remedy is a man. And it's the man, Jesus Christ. Verse 6 says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach to them that dwell on the earth. Now tell me, this gospel, how much of the world will it affect? It says to every nation, kindred, tongue and people. Is there anyone excluded? No one's excluded. Now I want you to see our mission is a worldwide mission. Now I want you to see verse 7. <coughs> saying with a loud voice, this is a part of the gospel, saying with a loud voice, fear God and do what? And give glory to him. This is what I want us to look at. It says give glory to God. Give glory to God. First angel's message. Give glory to God. Now, I'm not going to study this, but what is the glory of God? His character. his character. So the glory of God is his character. His character. This is what it is, God's character. The Bible says give glory to God. Now, I want to ask you a question. The everlasting gospel, it says that the everlasting gospel in verse 6, how is it going to the entire world? Look at verse 6 carefully. It tells us the means in which the gospel is, is coming to the knowledge of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. What is the means used for the gospel to come to their knowledge in verse 6? It's preaching. Can you see that? So the gospel, which giving glory to God is a part of the gospel, the gospel is to come to every nation through the means of what? Through the means of preaching. 
This is how the gospel is to come to every, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, which obviously is giving glory to God. I want you to see another way in which the gospel God designs that the gospel should come to the entire world. In other words, giving glory to God. If I'm going to give glory to God through preaching, how would that be? That would be that I'm showing people who God is through the written word. That's how I would be preaching and giving glory to God. In other words, I'll be showing people through the word of God who God is or God's character. That's giving glory. You're showing the people through the written word who God is. But now there's another way of doing it. I want you to see publicly of how we are to reveal the character of God besides preaching. Come with me in your Bible. I want you just to look at the principle. Not so much what the verse is saying, but let's gleam the principle. Come with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. Another way in which we are to give glory to God besides preaching. 1 Peter chapter 3. In other words, reveal God's character besides preaching without using the word. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. It says in 1 Peter 3 verse 1, it says, Likewise he wives, be in subjection to your own husband. Now watch this. That if any obey not the word, they may also without the word be one. So how, how, how are they to be one? Without the word of God. But how then if you're not going to use the word? It says one by the conversation of the wives. The word conversation just means the lifestyle. So question, what is another way of revealing God's character besides preaching? Based, based on their text is the way we live. The way we live our lives. The way we live. By demonstrating it. Let me give you a second and a third witness. Come and in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I want you to see what the Apostle Paul says, provoked people to good works. Someone says it was the word of God. I want you to see what Paul says. What provoked them to good works? Look at the principle. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 2. Are we there? It says, for I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them, in Macedonia, Macedonia, that at Achaia, now watch this, was ready a year ago, and your zeal had provoked very many. What did he say provoked him, the word of God, to do right? He says, no, people saw your zeal, and it provoked them to do as you done. So can you see, publicly speaking, besides preaching, if we're going to give glory to God, the stronger testimony to provoke people is not so much the preaching, but it's the lives we live. Give glory to God. In other words, reveal his character in your life. This will provoke others. Friends, let me ask you this. If somebody is trying to sell you a product and they themselves are not convinced that product works, would you buy it? But that's what we are doing with the world. We are trying to sell them Christianity, but at the same time, they can see with our lifestyle that we are doubting the very thing we are actually trying to sell them. And that's why they're not buying it. Do you know what is the greater testimony besides, because preaching is words. Preaching is words. Preaching is words. You know there's a saying, Preach the gospel and at times use words. Preach the gospel and at times use words. So then what should be the louder preaching? Do you love? Then at times use words. So I want us to see, give glory to God. In other words, reveal his character, not just through preaching, but through our lifestyle. Now let us look at God's character. I want us to look at God's character. Actually, this is what God is longing for. I want you to see what is God longing for. This one great thing. This is from our Father Cares, page 54. It says he cares for man. That's God. He cares for man, who is the image and the glory of God. 
He longs to see his children. What is God longing for? He longs to see his children reveal a character after his similitude. What is God longing for? If there's one thing that God is longing for, he's longing to see within you his character. This is what God's longing for. He's not longing for you to preach, to do many things, do these things, but a great longing on his heart is to see his character within you. Now, I want us to look at God's character. Let us see, because this is what he's longing for. He wants us to actually demonstrate or have his character. I want us to look at his character. Let us go to the first verse, Nahum. Let us go to the book of Nahum. Nahum, if you find Daniel, you just keep turning, you'll find Nahum. After Hosea, after Joel, you'll see Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Nahum. Nahum chapter 1. Nahum chapter 1. Yeah, one of the attributes of God which we don't really consider is this one. Nahum chapter 1. Nahum chapter 1, are we all there? I want us to see what does the Bible say concerning God, at least when Nahum looked at God. There's one attribute in which he specifically highlighted and he highlighted it first. Nahum chapter 1 verse 3. It says, the Lord is slow to anger. What is the first thing when Nahum, when he sees God? Now, all, all the prophets see God. In some sense, they see glimpses of his glory. When Nahum gets a glimpse of God's glory, when he looks and he sees the character of God, what is the first thing that Nahum says? That God is slow to anger. God is slow to anger. You know, like a snail. Slow. God is, there's one thing God is slow at. He is slow to anger. He is very slow to anger. What do we wish to do? We are to give glory to God. We are to reveal his character. What is one of the attributes of his character? Slow to anger. Slow to anger. This is God's character. He is slow to anger. I want us to look at this issue, which I don't believe is a mistake. I want us to read at least three, three, three different scriptures because the Bible says upon two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I want us to look at three witnesses and I want you to see friends, the issue of anger. Now let me ask you this before I even go any further. Is anger a sin? In other words, to become angry, to become angry is it a sin? Well, I want to say that to become angry is sin. Uh, to be angry is sin. <laughs> yes, there is. <laughs> Hang on. The anger in which the Bible refers to, which the Bible says constantly it refers to, is what we would record as sin. There's only two men in the Bible where we clearly see that their anger was not a selfish thing. It had to do with the character of God. And that nothing, but the anger of today, when everyone gets angry today, it's, it's the root of the selfishness itself. That's why you're getting angry. It's because someone tramps on your toes and you become angry. That is recorded as sin. But the anger that is outside of yourself and it has to do with God's character, you're angry because his character has been maligned. That's not sin. Now I want us to look at this issue slow to anger. Now, I'm going to say, biblically speaking, anger is a violation of the principles of God's law. It's a violation of God's character. Why? God is long-suffering. Now, I want us to look at three witnesses on this issue of slow to anger. And I want to ask you a question. Are you slow to anger? Are you slow to anger? You, I, I can't answer for you. You can only answer for yourself. Are you slow to anger? Because remember, God's character, those who are part of his church, who's going to be saved in the last days, they're going to reveal his character. And he's a part of God's character. If you're going to reveal it to the world, that God is slow to anger. Are you slow to anger? Because this is a part of his character. 
Those who give the loud cry, who give glory to God and fill the earth with his glory, they're not going to learn how to become slow to anger when the loud cry comes, it's too late. They're going to learn before what does it mean to be slow to anger. Now let me ask you this, there's no way you can say you're slow to anger unless there's, there's circumstances that are pressing you to become angry. And God's going to put you in those circumstances to see, to develop this attribute of his. He is slow to anger. Now I want you to see, let us look at God's character. We're going to look at three biblical witnesses, three verses from different writers. And I want you to see how come God's slow to anger. I don't believe God's slow to anger just because he's slow to anger. I believe there's attributes that God has that automatically drives him to become slow to anger. And all our striving to be slow to anger will be in vain unless we have these attributes which God has, which allows him to be slow to anger. You say, what attributes does God have, which is a fruit, slow to anger is a fruit of these attributes. It's two main attributes. Slow to anger is sandwiched in between these two main attributes. It sits in between these two main attributes. Remove these attributes and there's no slow to anger. The Bible does tell us a time is coming when these two attributes of God are gonna, there's a limit to them. And when those limit comes, wrath will be poured out upon the guilty inhabitants of this world. But I want you to see what attributes specifically to when every Bible writer writes, they sandwich slow to anger in between these two attributes. Come with me in our first text. Let us look at our first text, Nehemiah. Did I say Nehemiah? We'll come to Nehemiah. Okay, let's go to Nehemiah. Let us go there. Since I said it, let us go to Nehemiah. Nine. Nehemiah chapter 9. I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to read these three witnesses. And then I want you to tell me. Nehemiah chapter 9. Did I say Nehemiah 9? Verse 17. I'm actually in chapter 10, but it's Nehemiah 9. Verse 17. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 17. It says, are we all there? It says, and he refused to obey, and refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didest amongst them, but hardened their next, and their rebellion, am I reading right? They hardened their necks, and in their rebellion, appointed a captain to return to their bondage. Just talking about the children of Israel during the Exodus. Now watch this. But thou art God, but thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. Now I'm not going to talk much. I just read the text. I'm not speaking. You look at the text. You see it. I go to the next Bible writer. Come with me in your Bible now to the next Bible writer. I want us to go to Joel. Let us go to the book of Joel. After Daniel, you'll see Joel. Joel chapter 2. I want us to read Joel chapter 2. Verse 13. Joel 2 verse 13. It says in Joel chapter 2 verse 13. It says, Rend your hearts and not your garments. Turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. Is this a repetition of what, what, what Nehemiah said? Let us look at one more witness. Let's go to the man Jonah. Let us go to the man Jonah. Come with me to the book of Jonah. Jonah was the one that complained to God. Jonah chapter 4. Jonah chapter 4. Let us look at Jonah 4 verse 2. Jonah chapter 4 verse 2. Jonah is speaking to God about his character in verse 2. It says, and he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. What are all the Bible writers saying about God when he's slow to anger? What two things are sandwiched in between slow to anger? 
Great kindness is at the end. What precedes great kindness? No, 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 no. Before, because slow to anger, sandwich in between attribute. To, uh, there's two things. The two things uh, is that he's merciful. And what else? Yeah. It says that he's merciful, slow to anger. And what does the Bible writers keep saying next? Great kindness. Great kindness. Now, friends, let me ask you this. Do you know that if you are merciful and you have great kindness, it's easy to be slow to anger? It's because we are lacking being merciful and we are lacking being kind. Therefore, we don't know how to be slow in anger. Are you seeing this thing, <laughs> oh friends? So we need to study what is, mer- how do we obtain merciful, or how do we become merciful? What is merciful, and how do we obtain it? And what is kindness? Because if we're gonna demonstrate being slow to anger, these are the two attributes we need. We need to become merciful, and we need to have great kindness. Jesus said, in the conclusion of the Beatitudes, he says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So I'm saying if, we, if, if the, the height of the Christian experience, Jesus says, is becoming merciful. And do you know how Jesus views merciful? Jesus views merciful not as one of these small things. He views merciful or being merciful as one of the higher attributes of heaven. Let me prove that to you. Let me just prove that quickly and then I want to come back quickly to this issue of slow to anger. Come with me in your Bible very quickly to Matthew chapter 5 verse 48. Matthew 5, 48. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Matthew 5, verse 48. I want us to see Matthew 5, 48. It says in Matthew 5, we are coming to the conclusion of the study. We're going to look very briefly at merciful and kindness, and then we close. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. It says, be therefore perfect. After Jesus gives his lengthy talk on the Sermon of the Mount, this is his conclusion. He says, be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. So question, I'm not, not a question, I'm telling this here. Jesus gives the sermon, the Beatitudes, and then he comes to the conclusion of the gives how the Christian life should be. He talks on the entire Christian life. Matthew 5 is the entire Christian life. If you just study this, you know, inspiration says that if we only add the Sermon on the Mount, she says that that was sufficient to guide us into the kingdom of heaven. That's how powerful the sermon is. Now, nonetheless, at the conclusion of his sermon, he says, be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. So he builds up from blessed are the poor in spirit. In other words, you see your spiritual poverty. You acknowledge that your current condition is unpleasing to God. Then he says, blessed are they that mourn. As you see your bad condition before God, you mourn over your, 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 your poverty-stricken state. And then Jesus says, you become meek. Then you hunger and thirst after righteousness. So he goes through the length of the experience. And then he says, at the height, God is calling us to perfection. Now I want you to see Luke's account of this sermon. Luke replaces the word perfect with another word under the inspiration of the Spirit, which in the Spirit's mind, perfection and this word are the exact same thing. In other words, when you attain to this, the Spirit says you are perfect. Come with me to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. The exact same sentence just replaced with a different word. The word perfect is replaced. Luke chapter 6, verse 36. Luke 6, verse 36. Are we all there? It says in Luke 6, 36, Luke what word does the Spirit replace perfect word? Be he therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. What word in the Spirit's mind is synonymous with perfection? Merciful. So when a man or a woman becomes merciful in God's eyes, what are they attaining to? Perfection. 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 So I want us to look quickly, very quickly, and then we want to conclude. We'll come back with much, much more to study. But I want us to look at this issue very quickly, and then we want to study merciful and, and great kindness. I want us to look at this quotation in our, uh, our Father Cares, page 235. Speaking about anger, 
Now, let me ask you this. When a man's drunk, when a man's drunk, and if, I'm sure you've seen drunk people. When a man's drunk, anyone who fights, is it easy to stop that man, even though you might be able to control him? Can you change his mindset? It's very difficult. Why? He's what? He's intoxicated. He's not thinking clearly. I want you to see what inspiration says about the issue of anger. I want you to see this. Our, our Father Cares 235. It says, when one, when one gives place to an angry spirit, he is just as much intoxicated as the man who has put the gloss to his lips. You know why that's the case? When someone's angry and they wanna, you, you know all your reasoning to them does not, that means nothing. It's like they're intoxicated with anger. Friends, try it. When, 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 a, when a, someone's angry, man, they're hearing nothing. And every word that the person on the opposite end is saying to them, they, they see that as an attack against them. And it only, it's almost, it's fuel to the fire. When one gives place to an angry spirit, he is just as much intoxicated as the man who has put the gloss to his lips. Christ treats anger as murder. How does Christ treat anger? As a, you are a murderer. And the Bible says no murderer is entering the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said whoever is angry with his brother without a cause, is, is, Jesus says he's in danger of the judgment. That's Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5. Friends, God is slow to anger. He's not intoxicated. You know, if God was not slow to anger, I would not be standing at this pulpit and neither of you would be sitting there. Every one of us would be consumed. It says passionate words are a savor of death unto death. So question, when you speak passionately to someone, you're angry, are you bringing life to them or is it death to you and them? It's death. It's death. Now, by the way, you know, I always wondered, why did Paul use, because he's quoting Paul here. Paul says to some, we are sever, in 2 Corinthians, he says we are sever of life unto life, and to some we are sever of death unto death. Now, when I first read that in the Bible, I got, what does Paul mean? That I'm a sever of life to some, and I'm a sever of death to some. Until I read Acts of the Apostles. Actually, she says that Paul was borrowing his language from... What would take place during military wars? She says that during military wars, when a nation conquered another nation, they would take kept, captives back, back, to, the, back to their, their country. And as they were nearing home, the news would spread to that nation or that country or that city that our, 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 we have conquered. And so as they are coming home, the, what happens was celebrations begin to take place and they would light certain things that would give off certain smells, certain incense, certain smells, incense. And to the soldier, as he smells that, to him he's nearing home. But to the captive, you know what that smell is for him? It's not a smell of savor of life unto life. It's a smell of death that is going to his grave. So Paul says that my influence to some is a savor of life unto life. But to those who reject what I'm saying, my influence to them is a savor of death unto death. Now I want you to see, she says, he who utters them as not in, co in co cooperating, sorry, he who utters them is not cooperating with God to save his fellow man in heaven. Now listen to this, friends, every time you're angry and you utter angry words, you're intoxicated. And I want you to see how heaven records your passionate words when you utter them. It says in heaven, this wicked, what does the prophet call angry words? wickedness. She says, in heaven this wicked riling is placed in the same list as common swearing. You are a swearer. Someone says, I don't swear. I don't use vul vulgar language. You might not use vulgar language, but you're using passionate words. And in heaven, heaven records in the book that you just swore. 
This, friends, is solemn. If we're going to be a part of those who are going to give glory to God and demonstrate his character to the world, we need to learn to become slow to anger. This is an attribute of God. And the Lord showed me this this morning. I was speaking, he says, I'm slow to anger. This is my attribute. I am slow to anger. While hatred is cherished in the soul, there's not one iota of the love of God there. Imagine you say some passionate words and you die. Imagine you're driving or you whatever, someone cuts you in the line and boom, you die. Or you're driving and you're angry, someone cuts, you, cuts in and you say some angry and boom, you accident, you're dead. Where are you going to heaven? Going to hell. Friends, you don't think, don't think heaven, if sin entered into heaven, if this great mess was caused because of sin, God's not going to have this thing repeated again. Do you know, <laughs> friends, think of it. If we cannot, as, 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 as a Christian family, live in peace amongst each other without becoming angry, how can we live amongst a larger family in heaven without becoming angry? If you don't master it here, yeah, you're not going to master it there. When Jesus Christ comes back the second time, he's not changing our character. Only thing he's changing is our body. You are going with the same character. You know, Job says, naked I came into this world and what? Naked I'm going. Only one thing you leave in this world with, you not leave in this world with clothes. The Pharaoh's thought that when they die, put all my wealth into my mommy family and put all my wealth there. Do you know what happened to all their wealth that got stolen by rogues? No, they never go into the next world, world with all those wealth, with that wealth. Only thing we are leaving this world with is with our character. And that's going to determine whether we're going into life or whether we're going to death. The most important thing is our character. And God says one of my attributes is that I am slow to anger. I am slow to anger. Let us look again. Our, our Father Kies 235, same, para, same page. When you feel angry, when you feel what? When you feel an angry spirit arising. Now friends, to feel the angry spirit arising is not yet sin. It's not yet. It's arising. Someone's doing something and they, they're working on your nerves. Someone's saying something and in your mind, I'm going to be kind, but they better stop. I, 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 I'm going to allow them to go on just a little bit longer before I give them a piece of my mind. That's, that's how we think as Christians. At least I gave him some space, or I gave her some space, or I gave the child some, or whoever some space. Then they, they need it. And then we say, I'm not a doormat. They can't trample upon me. Friends, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. Did Jesus hurl any words of anger to those who are killing him? Those who are mocking him? No, friends. Now watch it. It says, when you feel an angry spirit arising, take what? Firm hold on Jesus Christ by faith. Friends, you know that this is a battle. This is a battle. When the spirit of anger is arising, inspiration says, take a firm hold on Jesus Christ. We're going to explain that practically. Because someone says, that's in the air, how do I do that? We're going to explain it practically. How do I take a firm hold on Jesus Christ? She says, utter number one, do not fall into the trap. When you are angry, what must, when, not angry, not angry, but when you feel the spirit of anger, what must you not do? Speak. Don't speak. No, you said speak. I'm saying don't speak. Don't speak. She, inspiration says utter no word. Utter no word. Someone says, but let me try. Let me try give them a soft answer. <laughs> Your soft answer, mm, but it's soft. <laughs> You're only adding fuel to the fire. Don't, don't do it. <laughs> Someone says, I tried a soft, no, you never try a soft answer. Utter no word. Number one, when you are angry, utter no. Now friends, I wish I could show you, the. this is what the prophet practiced. When her children would, 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 would like almost stir, she says that when she would feel the spirit of anger coming, she says she would leave the room and go and pray. 
so that she, she does not, she does not because she says she would be committing a worse sin should she retaliate in anger and correct them in anger. She said she would go into a room and pray. And then she would come back and tell them that at evening, I need to speak to you all. And she says many a time before even the sun sets, they would come and apologize. You know why? It works on them. I have to go and speak at evening. And before they get their talk, they come running. To, she says that they would do that. Before even evening comes, they would come and apologize. Now watch it. Number one is utter no word. If I'm going to be slow to anger, please, this is practical truth. What is the first thing? If I'm going to be slow to anger, what is the first thing I should learn? Utter no word. Utter no word. Someone says, but. You know what, friends, to be honest, if you utter no word, you'll find out in a, two hours or three hours later, the way I was feeling and I wanted to say it was best I never say it. It doesn't merit me saying that. Utter no word. Number two, she says, danger lies in the utterance of a single word when you are angry. So when, you, when you're angry and you want to utter a word, she says, what lies there? Danger. Don't do it. Don't do it. For a volley, folly of passionate utterances will follow. In other words, if you say one word, then it's going to be boom, 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 con continually angry words. The man, who, the man who gives way to folly in speaking passionate words bears false witness, for he is never just. Now, let me ask you this. When somebody's angry and they're speaking in anger, much of what they are saying is in an exaggerated light. Even though it might be true, some of it is true, but you know what has just happened? They have exaggerated that thing. Why they're angry? She says, he exaggerates he exaggerate every defect he thinks he sees. He is too blind and unreasonable to be convinced of his madness. What does she call anger? Madness. When you are angry, you are mad. You heard somebody say, I lost it. I lost it. I lost it. You, you, now think with me, think with me. When you lost it, someone took hold of it. When you lose it, you're not in, you said I lost it, meaning I'm not in control. I lost it. Somebody else took control. She says, look who took control. She says, he, tr he transgresses the commandments of God and in his end, his imaginated, imagination is perverted by not the inspiration of God, but by the inspiration of Satan. He knows not what he is doing. He knows what? Friends, when a person's angry afterwards, they look back and as if they were drunk. How did I say that? Why did I do that? It's like you are drunk. You think it's like you're sober now and you are looking back in your sober, sober, sobriety. And you are looking back and you're saying, oh my, what did I just say? Because being anger is the same thing as being intoxicated. She says, yeah, he knows not what he is doing. Why? Satan controls him. Blind and deaf. Try and speak to an angry man. In the midst of his anger, he is both blind and he's deaf. Meaning he can't see you and he can't hear you. The only thing before him is his problem. He sees and he hears nothing. And you can't convince him against his will. It says... Blind and deaf, he permits Satan to take the helm and guide him wherever he pleases. Friends, every time you're about to become angry, think that if you're going to lose it, someone's going to take hold of it. And it's going to be Satan. You rather go and cry on your knees in your closet than to speak an angry word. Now, you know what the wise man says in Proverbs 16.32? He says in Proverbs 16.32, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he that ruleth his spirit is better than he that taketh a city. The Bible says to be slow to anger, you're actually stronger than the mighty. You are stronger than Alexander. You are stronger than Caesar. You are stronger than these mighty men that conquered the world. 
if you can rule your own spirit. Proverbs 16, 32. Now, slow to anger. Now, I want us to come now. What's going to make us slow to anger? Speak to me. What's going to make us slow to anger? What makes God slow to anger? It's an open board test. Merciful and? And it's great kindness. So if I'm going to be slow to anger, I need A, to learn. I need to study merciful. I need to learn what is merciful, how to become merciful. And I need to understand something about kindness. These two attributes would help me to become slow to anger. Now, I don't know if our study is going to lead us there, but the Lord showed me something about merciful I never ever saw before. But I hope we can get there before we close. Now, I want us to look at our Bibles. Before we get to our Bibles, let's first look at the definition of merciful. This is the, this is the dictionary the prophet used. Merciful. What is merciful? It says that benevolence, benevolence is love, benevolence, mildness, or tenderness of heart, which disposes a person to overlook injuries. Now, what is merciful? Is that you overlook what? When somebody injures you, what do you a, a person who's truly merciful, a person can injure you, but you overlook it. Do you know today in the world, this has not prized, as it was not prized in the Jewish age. For some, like the world will tell you, hey man, they do you wrong, you do them wrong. They tell you this, you tell them back. But that's not heaven's principle. Heaven says, God, why God is slow to anger? Because he's merciful. Do you know that you, we injure God, but God overlooks those injuries. You say, what do you mean? Do you know by every sin, according to these high ages 300, by every sin, this is the exact words the prophet says, by every sin, Jesus is wounded afresh. He's wounded afresh. Now, again it says, it implies benevolence, tenderness, mildness, pity or compassion, clemency, but exercise, now watch it, now look at who mercy can only be exercised towards, but exercised only towards offenders. Let me ask you this. If your child is always doing the right, do you need to be merciful? No. There's no, mercy does not need it in, a, in existence if the people you love and are surrounded with are only doing the right. There's no need for mercy. Someone says, if they're only doing the right, then I'll be merciful. Well, you're deceived. Mercy can only exist in an atmosphere when people are not only doing you right. Now, question, where then would merciful, what mercifulness be needed? I will tell you where it would first be needed. It's inside the home. Why? Everyone has their own personalities. Do you think at times there's going to be some sorts of misunderstandings? In the church, don't you think there'll be some sorts of misunderstandings? Yes. So what, what would we need? We would need to become merciful. Someone says, but only if they apologize. Friends, merciful is exercised only towards offenders. They offended you. What do you do? You, you forgive. You forgive. Peter says, Lord, because the Pharisee says you do it, do three you do it, you do it once. Oh, Pharisee says you forgive three times. Pharisee says you do me wrong, I forgive you three times. I'm being merciful. Peter speaking to Jesus, he says, Lord, do we forgive them? Seven times. Pharisees say three, but I know you, you're gracious. Do we forgive seven times? Jesus said to correct Peter. Peter says, no, 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 Peter. It's 70 times seven in a day. That's 490 times. If you, if you say, okay, when do I stop forgiving them? You're going to have to, someone says, okay, let me start counting offense number one. Offense number two. Off I'm waiting, I can't wait for 490 then I know, listen, don't wait for 490 because you already, your mindset is wrong. You don't wait for 490. What Jesus is simply saying, you just keep forgiving. 
Now, I want us to see, so mercy for, let me ask you this, who do you exercise mercy, mercy against? I'm for, towards what? People that are only kind to you or people that are doing the right offenders. Thank you. Do you know at times your children will offend you? What should you do? Merciful. Do you know at times your relatives will offend you? What should you do? Merciful. Do you know at times husband or wife will offend you? What should you do? Merciful. Merciful. Now, let us look at the Bible quickly. Let us see how does Jesus view mercy. Let's just see in Jesus' mind, Lord Jesus, amongst the many, the many things of tight pain, the many things of keeping the Sabbath, all these wonderful things which we should be doing, can you tell us where do you cross mercy amongst all these good things? Fasting and all these good things. Come with me to Matthew 23. Let's see where Jesus closes mercy. Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. Matthew 23, verse 23. Matthew 23, verse 23. Jesus is speaking in a negative to the scribes and the Pharisees. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe, good din, of mint, anise, and cumin. But, he says, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Now, what is the weightier matters of the law? Judgment, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done and not left the others undone. Based on Jesus, where does he cross mercy? Amongst those common things of tight pain and many other things, or does he say that mercy is amongst the weightier matters? The weightier matters, friends. The weightier matters. This is mercy. Now, this is high clo highly clothed by Jesus. Let us see from inspiration what does she say about mercy. And then I want you to, to look. Mm, mm, mm. I don't know how to say this. But mercy, As much as slow to anger proceeds from being mercy. Because if you, if you, if you, question, let me just ask you. If you, 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 you extend mercy to the offender, question, would you be quick to anger or slow to anger? Slow, slow to anger. I want us, to, actually, let's first look at mercy and then I want to show you a key ingredient which I only saw this morning. That mercy is also a, a, a byproduct of something. As slow to anger is a byproduct of mercy, mercy is a byproduct of something. I want us just to see what the prophet says quickly on mercy. I'm coming back to great kindness. Now, this is from reflecting Christ. Before we look at what is mercy, listen to what the prophet says about mercy. The Lord Jesus said, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. There never was a time, there never was a time when there was greater need for the exercise of mercy than today. If ever we're going to exercise mercy, when does she say we need to do it? Today. There's a greater need, much greater need. This is from Mount of Blessings 21 and 22. Actually, I'll come back to that one. This is from the story of Jesus, page 61. I'll come back to Mount of Blessings. Now listen to what it doesn't mean to be merciful. It says, blessed are the merciful, Matthew 5, 7. To be merciful is to treat others better than they deserve. So what is it to be merciful? It's to treat, you, you might say, man, this person, they don't deserve, so, huh? this person don't deserve a plate of food. Or maybe they deserve a plate of food, but maybe they don't deserve this dessert. <laughs> now, merciful has been, you, you, you what? I'm just using that as an example. But merciful means that you treat them better than they deserve. They don't deserve A, but I'll give them A. That's, that's been merciful. Friends, do you know that we did not deserve the greatest gift of heaven? which was Jesus. We did not seek after God 
which led him to give Jesus. But he gave Jesus, according to Romans chapter 5, verse 8, God commended his love towards us while we were yet sinners. When did God give us his greatest gift? Not when we came and said, Lord, uh-uh. when we were still in our mess, God gave us our, his greatest gift. So being merciful, she says, is to treat others better than they deserve. That's being merciful. That will lead us to become slow to anger. It says, so God has treated us. So what is the grounds in which we should treat others better than they deserve? It's because God has treated us in that way. We ought to treat others in that way. Now listen to what she says. This is what she says. This is Mount of Blessings 21, 22. The heart of man is by nature cold and dark and unloving. By nature, our heart is unloving. And friends, it's a mystery. How unloving, unlovable beings can be loved so much by God. We are so unlovable, yet he lavishes his love upon us. To me, that's a mystery beyond mysteries. How could he love us? Yet he still loves us. The heart of man is by nature cold and dark and unloving. And whenever one manifests a spirit of mercy and forgiveness, he does it not of himself, but through the influence of the divine spirit moving upon his heart. Can I ask you a question based on this quotation? Just based on that, just that, that part, can you become merciful in and of yourself? Based on what I've just read here, or is this, or is this something done by the spirit for me? It's done by the Spirit, so it's a divine attribute. So when I'm talking about mercy, it's not something that you can, you can build up for yourself. Based on this quotation, it's an attribute of God which He shares with me through the Spirit of God. That's how I become merciful. Because it says, we love Him because He first loved us. God Himself, the source of all mercy, His name is merciful and gracious. He does not treat us according to our deserts. In other words, God don't treat us the way we need to be treated. He don't do that. He does not ask if we are worthy of his love, but he pours upon us the riches of his love to make us worthy. Now friends, that's powerful that we've just read. That God doesn't, she says here, he does not ask if we are worthy of his love, but he pours his love upon us to make us worthy. Think of that, that's sweet. God does not pour his love upon us because we are worthy, but he pours his love upon us to make us worthy. So then how should we view others that don't deserve this? Mm -mm. How does God treat us? He pours his love, even though we're so undeserving, upon us. So, this is merciful. Merciful is to treat people better than they deserve. This is merciful. Now, I'm actually going to conclude. I just mentioned these last two points and then I'm concluding. Just, I just want to show two more verses on this issue of merciful. Tell me publicly, I will quote one text and I will read one text. Let us go to Matthew chapter 18. I'm going to quote one text and I'm going to read one text, Matthew 18. Before I read Matthew 18, 18, I want to ask a question. Does anybody know what was the driving force in the life of Jesus? Because Jesus was merciful, Jesus had great kindness, and Jesus indeed was slow to anger. Does anybody know what drove Jesus? Love for God, that is true. Amen. Anything else? That indeed drove Jesus. Anything else, what drove Jesus? In other words, I'm saying that like, man, everything Jesus done was motivated by this one thing. Huh? Unity? Humanity, okay. What else is that? Love, okay, that is good. Friends, let me show you publicly quickly what were the things that drove Jesus, that moved Jesus. Come with me quickly, quickly, Matthew chapter nine. Matthew chapter nine. Matthew chapter nine. Look at Matthew nine, verse 36. Tell me what was the thing that moved him? 
Matthew 9, 36, constantly throughout the gospel, you see this. Matthew 9, 36, it says, but when he, that's when Jesus, but when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Question, what moved Jesus? Compassion. Come with me to Mark chapter one, quickly. Mark chapter one. Mark chapter one, verse 40 and 41. It says in Mark chapter 1, 40 and 41, it says, And there came a, a leper to him, beseeching him and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Verse 41. Jesus and Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand. Friends, I can show you verse of the verse of the verse of the verse. Matthew 14, 14, Jesus was moved with compassion. What was the driving motive of Jesus' life? Compassion. Question, I don't know if you'll saw it in the text, in these two texts that I read. What caused this compassion? Love. Uh-uh, that's true, it's love. But it says when Jesus saw them as sheep, Without a shepherd, he was moved with compassion. When, the, when he saw the leper's condition, he was moved with compassion. What moved him with compassion? It's when he saw the destitute condition of others. He could not be at ease when he saw people suffering. When he became acquainted with their suffering and moved him to action. Do you know that compassion, which is synonymous with sympathy as well, do you know that sympathy, compassion cannot exist in ignorance? In a book, Education, Inspiration says that it is acquaintance that awakens sympathy. You know what's acquaintance? Acquaintance means that you become familiar with this thing. Like you would not, and when you become familiar with it, it will, it will, it will arouse sympathy. Now let me illustrate what I mean. If you don't know there's people starving next door, will you have sympathy towards them to help them? What will awaken sympathy for these people? It's when you understand that they are starving. So what I'm saying is that compassion is also bound up or somebody is bound up in knowing this, these people's condition. This will arouse in sympathy or compassion. Think of it, when somebody does you wrong, if you truly look at their condition, what should it arouse in your heart? Looking at what they're doing and you see it's wrong. It should arouse sympathy or compassion towards them and not anger. Rightfully so. Now let me just come to the conclusion of this thing. Come with me to Matthew 18 quickly. Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Now friends, do you know in, currently in the world, there's no sympathy and compassion and mercy. You know what's in the world today? The world is filled with strife and war. Things are intensifying. You know this man, Putin, the president of a nation that has the most nuclear weapons in the world. Now I want you to see what Putin says. Putin, a couple of days ago, announces response to Finland joining NATO. Now, Finland joined NATO. Now, now, why? Does anybody know why? Does anybody know why? Does anybody know why did Putin invade Ukraine? They wanted to join NATO. So now Finland, which shares a border with Russia, Russia is one of the biggest countries in the world. Biggest, they share a border with, 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 with um, Russia, NATO, uh, Finland. Now Putin says that he, he responded to Finland joining NATO, and I want you to see what he says. Helens, how do you say that? Helensky, that's the capital of Finland, has not had any trouble with Moscow for years, but now, 
eat well. The Russian president has said, what does that sound like? Compassion, mercy, slow to anger? The world has stirred with the spirit of war. Inspiration says Maranatha 174. Putin says that Finland's in trouble. He says he's given them their word, his word, that since they have joined NATO, he says we're gonna have problems now with Russia. Now, this is what Russia says. Russia says they're not just fighting Ukraine inside Ukraine. You know who they said they're fighting inside Ukraine? NATO troops directly involved in Ukraine conflict, Russia said. Currently now, think of it. What is Russia closed with? Does anybody know what, what, what nations Russia is closed with? I'm saying um, there's a, all South Africa, China, BRICS, yes, BRICS, but they call something. They called, I forget the exact word, but this is what they called the Global South. I've, I've covered this before. Russia, China, and all these other nations, these developing nations, they are classed as the Global South. What, what is NATO called? What is the first, the first letter of NATO? North. So it's the South Russia versus the King of the North, America-led alliance, papacy. Even their names give it away. Now Putin, listen to Putin. I want you to hear what Putin had to say. Putin is going to tell you something which many people don't see in the news. He's going to tell you that America has soldiers messing up on Russia's border. You're not going to find that on the news. The news are not going to report what America is doing. But yeah, Putin's going to tell you that America has soldiers messing up on his border. Dear members of the board, the events of this year have confirmed, we all see, that the West continues to wage a hybrid war against Russia. It actively supplies the Kiev regime with intelligence information in real time, it sends military advisors, it transfers modern weapons systems, including highly mobile multiple launch rocket systems, long-range missile systems, cluster munitions, as well as a large number of new unmanned aerial vehicles. As we know, they plan to transfer F-16 multi-role fighters to Ukraine. Pilot training is underway in the West. Recently, the activity of the NATO military bloc as a whole has sharply increased. Significant forces from the United States, including aircraft, have been deployed to our borders. The number of alliance troops in Eastern and Central Europe has increased, as we know, they have already drawn Finland into NATO. Sweden is planning to join NATO, in fact, this means the next stage in the alliance's approach to our borders. Let me remind you that we all know very well that in 1991... Stop, but did you part when you said that America, the, the West, are massing military on its border? Friends, those things in this world are not going to become better and better. It's going to wax worst and worst. World War III, what is approaching? World War III approaches just as planned. Do you know what's the purpose of this, all these wars? Do you know what's the great purpose behind all these wars? It's depopulation. Why, what did they first try? They tried with the, the, lumen, the poison. They pulled down a video just the other day for that word. They pulled it. Now, after that, they said, let's do war. If massive depopulation is the end goal, then continued support for Ukraine is the way to go. Depopulation. Do you know why they want to depopulate you? Let me tell you why they want to depopulate you. Breeding. You breeding contributes to global warming. So the less of you, the safer the planet. Their great purpose is to depopulate you. Why? They say you're breeding. Climate change. Climate change. Now, friends, I'm going to just sh share with you this quickly, and then I want to close. I want to share this. Oh, I never put it in. I never put it in. Oh, I was supposed to have put it in. I would have shown. Mm, mm, mm. Next time, I'll show you. Elon Musk and 
few others, you'll hear them talking about eternal life. We'll show you in the next study. But they are planning to download your brain into a chip with your so-called personality so that when this body dies, they just take that and implant it and you're back alive. They're calling that eternal life so that you never die, you keep living on. We'll prove that. Do you know what, what, what that reminds me of? The Tower of Babel. They tried to make another way of saving themselves than the way God said. A way to heaven. Tell you the, the end is here. Now I want to conclude. Let's conclude Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18. I want us to see what leads to be merciful. I said we're supposed to look at great kindness. Mm -mm -mm. We're not going to make it. Let us look at quickly Matthew chapter 18. I want us to see Matthew chapter 18. Verse 26, Matthew 18, 26. It's speaking about the servant that owed his master. I want you to see this. It says, the servant therefore fell down and worshiped him, saying, Lord, have, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Look at verse 27, what is Lord done? In other words, his Lord's gonna forgive him, have mercy, but look what led to the mercy. Look at verse 27. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and had, that word forgave means mercy, and forgave him his debt. Question, based on that verse, what led the, the Lord to have mercy? What did the Lord have? He had compassion, compassion, compassion. Compassion. If we have compassion, it's easy to be merciful, slow to anger and have great kindness. Remember, remember what Jeremiah said in Lamentations 3, 21. He says, this I call to mind, therefore I have a hope, verse 22. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. It is of the Lord's what? Mercies that we are not consumed. Then he gives the reason why there's mercy. He says, because his compassion fails not. Mercy exists simply because of God's compassion. That's why it exists. Now friends, there's so much more to say. I'm going to close here. Let's just see what compassion is. This is compassion. Compassion is suffering with another. So compassion is when you look at someone and you see how they're going on. Compassion means you, you, you almost feel for them. You're not feeling for yourself. If you start feeling for yourself and say, look how they're going on with me, you're going to become agitated and you're going to retaliate in anger. But if you think on them and you're saying, shame, they're not happy the way they're going on. That's compassion. Do you know if you're feeling for them, there's no way you're going to become angry. Why? You, you, you're thinking of their misery. And because of their misery, you have compassion, you're not gonna become angry. Compassion is suffering with another painful sympathy. That's what Jesus has for us. And we should have for him painful sympathy. A sensation of sorrow excited by the distress or misfortune of others. That's compassion. And this is what we ought to have. Now, I conclude on this. I'm gonna read one quotation and then I conclude on two Bible verses. Let me read this quotation and then I close. There's so much more, I'm skipping. I'm skipping all these quotations, it's fine. But let me come to this one. Mount of, because I believe this is the key. The other quotations talk about storing the word in your mind. When someone agitates you, just repeat the word in your mind. Inspiration says that helps, besides prayer. But now, Mount of Blessings, page 16, I want you to see what's the real source of you becoming angry and losing it. Mount of Blessings, page 16, she says, it is the love of what? It's the love of self that destroys our peace. Think of it. Why do you become agitated? It's because you're trying to save God's self. You don't want anyone to tr stamp, tramp upon self's toes, and that's why you don't have peace. When self's dead, no matter what happens around you, you will have peace. Your peace will not be determined by circumstances around you. Inspiration says, it is the love of self that destroys our peace. While self is alive, we stand ready continually to guard it from mortification and insults. But when we are dead 
and our lives are hid with Christ in God, we shall not, we shall not take neglects or slights to heart. We shall be deaf to reproach and blind to scorn and insult. Why are we not blind to scorn and insult today? Why when someone insults us or scorns us or reproaches us, there's a retaliation? It's because we are not dead. You say, what do you mean? Uh, you know, let me ask you this. You are a funeral. Someone's in the coffin whom you really hate. For years you hated this person. They bullied you all your life. They stole your mother's cell phone. They stole your bike when you were small. They, they stole the food out of your house. And you say, you know what? For all the wrong he has done, I'm going up to that coffin and I'm going to slap him. And you come up to the coffin and you give him, as he's laying there, you look behind you, no one's looking, and you give him a nice slap to say, this is for all the wrong you have done for me. At least go down with the slap and you give him a nice slap, boom. And as you slap him, he gets up out of the coffin, he slaps you back and he puts himself back down. Question, was that man truly dead? How do you know he was not dead? Because he retaliated to you. A dead man cannot retaliate. So when you retaliate, you know what? That's an evidence of self is still alive. He's not dead. He's not dead. So inspiration is saying here, the reason why we keep falling into the sin or becoming angry, we are not dead. Come with me to Romans 6 verse 7. Quickly, I'm concluding on these two scriptures. Romans 6 verse 7. Romans chapter 6 verse 7. It says in Romans 6 verse 7, For he that is dead is freed from sin. Which kind of people are freed from sin? Is dead. You are dead to self. And because you're dead to self, now sin has no dominion over you. But someone says, how do I die? Paul got this in Galatians 2 verse 20. He says that I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I love Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. In other words, Paul says that I am next to Jesus. In other words, my eyes is fixed on Christ. And because my eyes is fixed on Christ, it leads me to place self on the cross. I am crucified with him. And Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, he says, I love. Now think of it, Paul, you're saying you're dead, but then you are saying you're alive. You said you are crucified, but you're saying you're alive. Paul is saying, I am crucified with Christ. He says, nevertheless, I love. Then he says, yet not I. Who is alive? He says, not me. He says, but Christ. What does he say? But Christ, but Christ, Christ dwelleth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved, not the world, who loved me. Yes, he loves the world, but Paul says, no, 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 no. When you read this, you must understand that Jesus never just died for the world. He loved me and he gave himself for me. So Paul says, when I look at Calvary, he says, I see Jesus dying. I don't see him dying for the world, even though that is true. He says, I see him dying for me. And that leads me to crucify myself in view of him dying. And then because I'm crucified, he says, yet I'm living, yet it's not me that's living, it's Christ who, 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 who's alive. It's Christ who's living out his life through me. Friends, this is the ingredient. If we're going to have self to die, we have to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. There's no way, friends, there's no way you can be cured from the venom of sin without looking. Not by a glance, but the eye must be fixed. We're actually told in Desire of Ages 302. She says, if the eye is fixed on Christ, the work of the Spirit ceases not until the soul is conformed into his image. So she says that if you want the Spirit to continually work on you and transform you, she says your eye must be fixed on Christ. If your eye is fixed, the Spirit ceases not until your soul is conformed into his image. Friends, to fix your eyes on Jesus means pick up the eye of ages. Pick up the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read them over and over and over and over again. Read desire of ages and friends, you won't, someone says, oh, I'll become bored. You won't become bored. If you sincerely pray before you open up those books, Lord, I'm not seeking so much head knowledge, but I'm seeking heart transformation. And as I pick up these books, please, 
Would you please do this thing for me? Please, can you change my heart? That's a prayer God will not, he will not overlook. And even if we feel we are too sinful to approach God, inspiration says in the book Desire of Ages, I think it's page 266, she says that if we will fall at the feet of Jesus, saying in faith, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. She says you will hear the answer, I will be thou clean. Jesus wants to cleanse us, but we must come to him in faith, she says. Paul says that he is crucified with Christ. Why? His eyes were fixed on Jesus. Friends, if we're going to ever master these things, now we never finish this, but if we're ever going to master being slow to anger, merciful, it's by beholding him who has these attributes that we become like him. If I'm not fixing my eyes on Jesus, I can try my hardest, it's not going to work. I need to constantly look, constantly look, and the more I'm looking, I'm going to be transformed. I will be transformed into the same image, into the same image. I conclude, oh friends, this Pope, the man of sin, I don't know if I should conclude there. Let's just conclude, I'll come back to this another time. I don't know how come I, I left this thing out. How did I leave it out? Hmm. How did I leave it out? It's fine. Now, I conclude with this last thing, and then I, I pray. When was homosexuality legalized by the papacy and then America fully endorses the Pope? Watch here. 20? 23. Now, what's, what's the name for um, same-sex marriage? National? Same sex law, NSL. What's, what's, what's the name for Sunday law? National Sunday law. National same sex law, national Sunday law, are they twins? Question, when twins are born, are they born far apart or are they born closely? So in 2023, national same sex endorsed, what must we expect 2024 going forward? Plus, what must we expect 2024 going forward? A twin. What precedes a twin is a financial crisis. I want you to listen to this. Henry, I believe his name is Henry Dent. He predicts, he's an econo economist, predicts. Listen to what he predicts. Meanwhile, economist Harry Dent is making a dire prediction about the market next year. He says 2024 is going to bring, and I'm quoting him now, the biggest crash of our lifetime. Economist John Wonski is here. What, what are the economists predicting for 2024? The biggest crash in our lifetime. Friends, going forward, the world's not going to become better and better. Inspiration says that trouble is only going to increase. From the footmen to the horses and then to the swelling of the Jordan. There's no decreasing in pace, but increasing. May God help us to get ready to meet him in peace. Shall we pray? Let us reverently kneel. Our kind and loving Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this reminder or this new revelation of your character. If indeed we're going to be a part of those who are going to give the loud cry to the entire world, if indeed we're going to give glory to you by revealing your character to the world, we need to demonstrate within our lives the very attributes that you have. And one of those attributes has been slow to anger. Thank you for revealing to us yeah, the sinfulness of anger, but also the remedy and that remedy is in Jesus. Even if we have fallen before in anger, we are truly thankful, Father, that in Zechariah chapter 13, we are told that a fountain has been opened up for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Israel, a fountain for sin and uncleanliness. And that fountain has been opened up at Calvary. Even if we have fallen before on this point, we know there's hope for us. And that hope is found in coming to Jesus. 
I pause the prayer, you say, Lord, I realize issues with anger and I need victory on this point. I need, I want to become slow to anger. I want to become merciful. I want to have this compassion. Lord, please assist me. As I look at Jesus, please develop these attributes in my life. Very simple, appeal if that's you, because heaven records these things. This is not just for the sake, heaven records and sees, okay, there's a response here, and angels are assigned to assist us if we would cooperate with them. If that's you, I would just say, just raise your hand. Loving Father, you see the hands that are raised. Our hands are raised because we are asking you, Lord, that you'd please help us to develop these attributes. As you have took hold of Peter's hand, as he was sinking in the water, and he cried, Lord, save me, Lord, help me, immediately you stretch forth your hand. And so we are asking, Lord, to please help us. Yeah, we truly like the disciples on that stormy boat, that stormy night on that boat, we cannot save ourselves from these things. These things are heart issues, and only Jesus can deliver us from these things. Please may you help us, Heavenly Father. Please may our eyes be fixed on Jesus, that we might be changed into the same image from glory to glory. Please bless us, dismiss us with your blessing, and prepare us, Lord, for the coming crisis, which is just months away. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Someday the silver cord will break, and I no more as now shall sing. But all the joy when I shall wake within the palace of the King, and I shall see him face to face.